Okay, this tutorial is going to look at um, basically the, the periodic table um, in a little bit more detail. Um, and we're, we're going to go into to more detail than, than you would have um, done when you were in year 8. Um, so we're going to look at, at the arrangements and trends in the periodic table, um, kind of how it's been organized, but also look at a few of the groups more specifically. So let's get into it. So firstly, um, let's talk about what, it, what is that term group, and there's also another one, period, um, actually means. So a quick recap, the groups are the columns up and down, um, and they're numbered often using no Roman numerals, so like this, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So it pays to be familiar with your Roman numerals. So just, just a recap there, if the number's before the V, that's 5 less 1, so 4, 1 less than 5, here it's 1 more than 5, so that's 6, 2 more than 5, 7, and 8. Now just be aware, the numbers sometimes you'll see in a textbook or you'll see online um, on a website or something, you'll see the periodic tables in, a, in an expanded version, there's another step down and it's longer, and sometimes people refer to this as group 18. So for instance, if we look down here, this group, this block in the middle, if that's included, um, the table becomes longer. And if you numbered them 1, 2, 3, you would actually get to 18 here. In this one, in fact, they've actually labeled them like 3B and 4 and, you know, B, 5B and all those sorts of things. Um, and then they carried on with the original numbering at the top. So guys, um, we will try to follow the numbering 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Because for these sorts of things, we're only going to look at the first 20 elements. So we can actually cut that block out in the middle there. In fact, on even even on this periodic table, this block down the bottom is actually supposed to slot in roughly where these where these white uh, boxes are. So there should be another step down, and the periodic table should be longer again. Um, but it doesn't usually fit very well on an A4 page, and because these bottom ones are hardly ever used, we tend to just um, most people leave them out or just leave them at the bottom there just in case um, you do need to use them. So anyway, um, guys, just be aware we tend to talk about these groups as being group one, two. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and the last one being 8. Um, but on some textbooks or some websites, you might see the last one being referred to as group 18. Anyway, back to our periodic table. So those are the groups, the columns up and down. Our periods are the rows across. So period 1, period 2, period 3, and period 4 being the rows across. Okay, so in a, looking at that in a little bit more detail, the periods, all right, as you move across, um, the elements just increase um, uh, in, in their number of protons by one. So the number of protons increases by one as you go across. So um, that's probably just recap from year eight. Um, but um, the, the period number also tells us how many shells or how many layers of electrons the atom have. So if we have a look here, period one, they've all got one shell or one layer. Period two, all have two shells or two layers. Three, all have uh, three uh, electron shells or, or layers, and four have four, obviously. Um, so this is quite handy. If we asked you how many uh, layers or shells of electrons does does sulfur have, you can just look at, oh, it's in row three, in period three, um, so we'll have three, rather than having to work out, okay, sulfur is 16, that means it's got 16 electrons, that'll be arranged two, eight, and then six, okay, right, three, row, uh, three shells, um, you can just refer to the actual row number. So the number of shells isn't, isn't too important. Um, we're probably more interested in this, the groups. So the columns, the groups going up and down, are chemical families. And actually, the periodic table was uh, elements have, have been arranged into groups long before we knew about their, their uh, structure um, and, and especially those arrangement of the electrons. So these groups were kind of originally based on their properties. So the elements in the same group are basically a chemical family that behave in similar ways. But interestingly, now you might think that, that elements would behave in a similar way because they're a similar size. But every group has quite a, a vast array of, of um, atoms of different sizes. So it's not actually got to do with sizes. It's got to do with the number of valence electrons. So what you notice is that the chemicals in the same group, the elements in the same group, have the same number of valence electrons. They've got the same number of electrons in that outermost shell. And we'll just go back and I'll show you that. So here you can see uh, in group one, they've all got one electron in their outer shell. Group two, all have two electrons in their outermost shell. Group three, all have three electrons in their outermost shell. Group seven, all have seven electrons in their outermost shell. Group eight, 
Well, there's one exception here. Helium only has two. The rest will have eight. But actually, helium, the first shell only holds two. So what we can say about group eight is they all have a full outer shell. Um, so helium being the one exception there. Um, but it still kind of follows the rule. Helium still has a full, that group all have a full outer shell. So um, let's, let's get into, into um, a little bit more detail. Group one actually has a special name. They're called the alkali metals. So group one has a special name, the alkali metals. Um, and these metals are highly, highly reactive. Now, the, the reason for that is, if you remember, we... Um, um, we said if an element uh, almost has a full outer shell, it will be very reactive. So these ones have one outer, uh, one extra electron in their outer shell. For them, the easiest way to get a full shell is just to lose that electron because the next shell is, is essentially full. So these, uh, these elements all tend to try and lose that one electron, and they will react quite violently in order to, to try and get rid of that electron. Um, I'll play you a little quick video, and we'll talk a little bit more about... Um, the, this group. Whether you've left school or you're still at school, you can appreciate the sheer fun and mayhem that chemistry can be. There's so much to it. Bunsen burners, mixing chemicals. Very nice. Now, you may have been allowed to mix very small amounts of lithium with water. You may, if with a responsible adult, have mixed H2O with sodium. And you may, under very strict scientific control, have witnessed potassium mixed with water. But the odds are, if you have, it will only ever have been on one of those rubbish science videos. There you go, mate. Present. Oh, thank you. These next two are the dog's nuts of the periodic table. They are, if you like, the king and queen of alkali metals. Mix these babies with water, stand well back, and watch the mayhem. And that's just what we're going to do. Mr Tickle, bring on the rubidium. Here it is. Is that it? Well, it might not look like much, Richard, but it's a highly reactive metal. It's sealed in this glass tube under argon atmosphere conditions, just for safety. Right, so what's going to happen when you drop that in the water? Well, imagine, if you will, letting off a hand grenade in a bathtub. Right-o, I'm off. Have that. OK. Good luck. <sighs> OK, Tickle. Drop the rubidium in the water. Stand back, everybody. This one's going to be bad. Our two grams of rubidium will only react when our specially designed vial dissolves in the water, which gives John a few crucial seconds to get into our safety zone. Wow. That is more like it. Only on Brainiac do you get that kind of science. But I believe we can go one better. There is one more alkali metal we can legally use. Yes, Richard, cesium, the emperor of alkali metals, particularly nasty, could go off at any time. And that's it? Oh, yes. Brilliant. I like it already. Now, what's that going to do when it hits the water? Imagine a depth charge in a bathtub. Fair enough, mate. I'll leave you to it. Good luck. Thank you. OK, John, go for it. Warning, 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 extreme danger, clear the area. As our cesium sinks in the water, the rapid generation of hydrogen gas should produce quite an explosion. And it does. <laughs> Magnificent. And I think that concludes today's experiment. There is, I should say, one more, even more reactive metal, francium. But for some reason, they wouldn't let us have any of that. Still, so, there you go. Today's lesson, never mixed alkali metals with water. So, looking at our group one elements, um, they're, they're called the alkali metals. We said they're highly reactive. They're all basically trying to lose that one spare electron so that they have a full outer shell. It's easier for them to lose one and then the next shell is, is already full so they've got a full outer shell than it would be to try and gain seven electrons. Um, 
So they're all going to try and lose one electron to gain that full outer shell. And that's what makes them so reactive. Now one important thing to note that was kind of done in the video was basically that they increase in reactivity as we go down uh, the group. Now that the reason for that is, basically if we look at hydrogen, so if I clear that, uh, looking at hydrogen, uh, hydrogen has one proton in the nucleus and an electron. So that electron is strongly attracted to the nucleus, and it's held quite tightly in that position. It can rotate around the nucleus, um, but it's, it's held quite tightly um, in that atom. Whereas as we start to go down, what you notice is that, for instance, in potassium, this electron is, is much further away from the nucleus. So that already reduces the hold on that electron. But it's also it's shielded. We call this electron shielding. Uh, these electrons that are in between these other shells um, are actually repelling that electron. So the, the outermost electron is attracted to the nucleus, but repelled by these electrons. So essentially, the more shells, the less tightly the electrons in the outermost shell are held. And because these guys are trying to get rid of one electron, the further away it is from the center, the easier it's going to be for it to react to get rid of that last electron. So getting rid of that last electron um, is going to be easier as we go down the group. What that means is basically, once again, um, the reactivity increases as we go down the group um, as a general rule. Cool. All right. So, guys, you're not expected to know about the electron shielding, but I thought I'd explain it to you. You are expected to know that, that alkali uh, metals are, are highly reactive. They're all trying to lose one electron, and they increase in reactivity as we go down the group. Okay? So that's an important point to remember. All right. So we'll clear that, um, and we'll go on to our next one. So our next group... Uh, group 2, the alkaline earth metals, and I'll play you another little clip for these. Alkaline earth metals are harder and more dense than the alkali metals. Although magnesium does not react with water, calcium and barium do. Because of their reactivity, these elements do not exist free in nature. Calcium hydroxide, known as slaked lime, is used in farming and gardening to neutralize acidic soil. Dissolved calcium and magnesium compounds are commonly the cause of hard water. Insoluble barium sulfate is used to provide contrast during x-raying of the intestinal tract. Okay, so group two. Um, basically, uh, the alkaline earth metals are, are slightly less reactive than the alkali metals. They all have two valence electrons, they're trying to lose two electrons to gain an out, uh, a full outer shell, um, and like the video said, uh, they're slightly harder and slightly more dense um, than, the, um, than the alkali metals. But otherwise, um, that's, that's basically all you need to know for the, um, the alkaline earth metals. Group 7, the halogens. So this is the second to last group on the periodic table. Um, so we'll just play a clip for them. The halogens form the seventh group in the periodic table, located just before the inert noble gases. The halogens are the most toxic and reactive of the non-metal elements. Each halogen has a distinctive color, getting darker as you move down the group. They are also poor conductors and have low melting and boiling points. Fluorine is a highly toxic pale yellow gas. It is the most electronegative and reactive of all the elements in the periodic table and can even form compounds with the noble gases. Because of its immense reactivity, it is difficult to isolate and store in its pure form. Chlorine is a yellowish-green gas that combines with nearly all elements. We use chlorine's high water solubility to our advantage by adding it to drinking water to kill harmful bacteria. Bromine is the only non-metallic element that is a liquid at room temperature. It is isolated from seawater for industrial use. It is a brown, noxious, and heavy liquid that is highly corrosive to human flesh, causing sores when exposed to skin. Iodine is a shiny, bluish-black solid. Heating iodine to just over room temperature causes it to spontaneously sublime meaning that it changes directly from a solid into a gas. Iodine readily reacts with most elements in the periodic table. 
but it will be displaced from its compounds by any of the lighter and more reactive halogens. Astatine is the only radioactive element of the halogen group. The longest half-life recorded for this element is just over 8 hours. Astatine has a metallic appearance and is semi-metallic in nature. The halogens are typical non-metals with relatively low melting and boiling points. The melting and boiling points increase steadily going down the group. Fluorine and chlorine are gases at room temperature. Bromine is a reddish-brown liquid. And iodine and astatine are solids. Looking at the periodic table can help explain the reactivity of the halogens. Here, the elements are listed in order of their atomic number, which represents the number of protons in an element's nucleus. In its normal, or ground state, this nucleus is also surrounded by an equal number of electrons. And as the atomic number increases, so does the size and mass of the atoms. In the periodic table, each horizontal line is called a period, and it represents the number of electron shells normally possessed by the element's atoms. For example, there are four electron shells in an atom of bromine, so it lies in period 4. Meanwhile, an atom of astatine in period 6 has six electron shells. As you read across the table from left to right, the vertical lines of elements are called groups. Elements in a group have the same number of electrons in their outermost electron shells. These are called valence electrons, and they dictate how elements interact. Elements in the same group generally interact with other elements in similar ways. None of the elements greater than atomic number 83 are completely stable. Astatine, with an atomic number of 85, is the only radioactive element in the group. Halogen comes from the ancient Greek halo, meaning salt, and genus, meaning former. Minerals containing chlorine and bromine are found naturally in rock and sea salt. The halogens all have seven valence electrons, so all the elements in the group have similar chemical properties. Almost all atoms need eight electrons in their valence shell to be stable. Because they only need one more electron to have a complete valence shell, the halogens are extremely electronegative and very reactive. As you move down the group from fluorine to astatine, each element is less reactive than the one before it. This occurs because the attractive force of the positive nucleus becomes weaker as it is blocked by an increasing number of electron shells. Okay, so group 7, the halogens. Uh, group 7 uh, basically all have 7 valence electrons, so they all just need one more to get a full outer shell. Um, and that's why they're going to react to to try and get that extra electron. So the things you need to know about the halogens, uh, they're all trying to gain one electron. That's why they react so readily with metals that tend to try and lose electrons. Um, uh, and especially the group 1s, that's kind of a perfect partnership. Those group 1, those alkali metals are all trying to lose an electron. These uh, halogens are all just trying to gain one. Um, one thing to note here, you, you will have noticed from the video, um, that the activity, the reactivity increases as you go up the group. And that basically is because um, the less num the number of shells, the greater the, the attraction that the nucleus, full of those positive protons, has on, on electrons. And that means it's, it's going to be more able to rip off that one extra electron off another element um, to fill its outer shell. So remember, in contrast to the group 1, in group 1, the reactivity, as a general rule, increases as we go down the group. And that's because these guys, they have less hold on that, that outermost electron. It's going to be easier to get rid of it. Here, they've got a greater hold on the electrons going up the group, so they're going to be more able to rip an electron off another element. So it kind of makes sense. It's kind of equal and opposite. Group 1, increasing in reactivity, uh, generally speaking, as we go down, and group 7, basically, generally uh, increasing it in reactivity as we go up the group. Okay, um, so let's just clear that and move on to our next one. 
So group eight, the noble gases. Uh, these are the ones that are just uh, basically totally unreactive. They're in group eight. They've got eight valence electrons. They've already got a full shell. But I'll play you a quick little video clip for them. The noble gases are the most stable group of elements. They are all colorless and odorless. With a few exceptions, they are inert, meaning they do not readily react with other elements. Helium is the second most abundant element in the universe, but it is rare on Earth. Because it is so light, it easily escapes the atmosphere. Most earthbound helium is in natural gas deposits deep underground. Neon is best known for the colorful lights of Broadway and Las Vegas. Not known to form any compounds, neon is completely inert. Argon is the third most abundant gas in the Earth's atmosphere. It is often employed to create inert environments for industrial processes and light bulbs. Krypton is occasionally combined with argon to create unreactive atmospheres for industrial processes. It is also used for lighting in high-speed photography. In 1962, scientists were able to form a compound between xenon and fluorine, making xenon the first noble gas to react with another element, and proving that even the noble gases can form compounds under the right conditions. It is most commonly used in high-powered and strobe lights. Radon is the only radioactive noble gas. It was first observed as a decay product of radium. It may present a health hazard if it is found inside a house. To understand why it is so difficult for the noble gases to form compounds, Let's take a closer look at the periodic table. The elements are listed in the order of their atomic number, which represents the number of protons in an element's nucleus. In its ground or normal state, the nucleus is surrounded by a number of electrons equal to the number of protons. As the atomic number increases, generally so does the size and mass of the atoms. Reading from top to bottom, each horizontal line on the table is called a period. Each period represents the number of electron shells normally occupied by an element's atoms. For example, a krypton atom has four electron shells, so krypton lies in period four. Meanwhile, a radon atom, in period six, has six electron shells. Reading across the table from left to right, the vertical lines of elements are called groups. Elements in a group have the same number of electrons in their outermost electron shells. These are called valence electrons, and they dictate how elements interact. Elements in the same group generally interact with other elements in similar ways. None of the elements greater than atomic number 83 are completely stable. All of them, including radon, are radioactive. All the noble gases reside in group 18 because each one has a full valence shell. A helium full shell has two electrons. All the other noble gases have eight electrons in their outermost shell. Because the noble gases need no electrons to be stable, they rarely react with other elements. Only the heavier noble gases form compounds and then only in special laboratory conditions. Krypton, xenon, and radon will react because as you move down the group, an atom's hold on its valence electrons becomes weaker. The stability of the noble gases is actually a useful property. These gases are used in many situations where an unreactive gas is needed to maintain a safe and constant environment. Industrial processes such as welding rely on atmospheres of noble gases to prevent explosions. And vintners use argon to prevent wine from turning to vinegar. All of the noble gases will conduct electricity. Neon may be the most familiar gas used for lighting, 
but argon, krypton, and xenon also fluoresce, and combined, they create many different colors. Okay, so uh, group eight, the noble gases, totally unreactive, all gases uh, have a full valence shell. That's basically all you need to know. All right, going on, the last little point that I want to cover um, is this. You're, you're expected to have a rough idea of where you would find uh, solids, liquids, and gases on the periodic table. Now, I should qualify that. Uh, basically, guys, uh, all of these things, in theory, could be a solid, liquid, or gas. It depends on the temperature. So at room temperature, all the green ones here, uh, like hydrogen at the top, um, and all the green ones down this end, are all gases. So hydrogen is a bit of an exception. It's on the metal side, um, but it's not considered a metal. And on a lot of periodic tables, for that reason, they actually put hydrogen up the top here, floating off on its own. So the gases, apart from hydrogen, are our noble gases, and there's a few more here. Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine. Okay, so you're expected to, to be aware that those are gases. There's only two liquid elements on the periodic table. Uh, so bromine and hydrogen, uh, sorry, bromine and, and mercury, Hg, um, are the only two liquids at room temperature. And it's interesting that one of them happens to be a non-metal, bromine is a non-metal, and one of them happens to be a metal, mercury. Um, so those are the only two that are liquid at room temperature. Now you're probably wondering, some, some students immediately sort of think, no, but hold on, I know of a whole bunch of things that are liquids at room temperature. Uh, but remember, all of those things you're thinking of are compounds. Like water, H2O, is a combination of hydrogen and oxygen. And when they combine, they form a compound that, yes, it's liquid at room temperature. But the elements uh, that they're made out of hydrogen and oxygen are actually both gases at room temperature. So the only elements... That are, that are liquids at room temperature are this one here, bromine and hydrogen. So I hope that helped, guys. Um, that's basically it. Um, this one's probably worth watching a second time. Um, there's some real key ideas in here. And because it ties together those ideas of electron configuration and the properties of the elements and the organization of the periodic table, you're going to get asked quite a lot of questions on these because it's a great opportunity for us as teachers to essentially assess you on multiple ideas at once and see that your understanding of how those ideas link together. So definitely one to learn or maybe even uh, worth watching this video again. So guys, I hope that helped and I hope you enjoyed it.